airplane crashed, you would easily detect that there's something wrong with the flight. You would be a little sluggish about getting in the next plane. Well, every other marriage crash. So there must be something that's going on with the family. Satan has launched an attack upon the house. When I lived in the country, I used to do a lot of snake hunting. While my brothers and sisters and uncles would go to the lake to fish, I would carry my rifle to kill snakes. Whenever I would see a snake, I would never aim at his body. I would never aim at his tail. I would zoom in on his head. Once I got the head, I didn't have to worry about the rest of the snake because he would be there the next day. Growing up in the country during the winter season, we would kill hogs around Thanksgiving. And my daddy taught me how to kill hogs. We'd go out and call them. We would never try to shoot them in the hip the ham, the shoulder, the ribs, would always shoot right between the eyes. And we could drop him right in his tracks. Once you eliminate the head, the rest of the hog is there. I want to show you something that you just finished reading. In Exodus chapter 1, verse 22, it said, And Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born ye shall cast into the river. That means kill it. Kill every boy, drown him, destroy him, eliminate him. But watch this, and every daughter ye shall save alive. Pharaoh is a type of Satan. He is symbolic to the devil himself. Why is it that man is a threat to Satan, but woman is not? What's the difference? Because you say we are equal. Let me read it again. And Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born you shall cast into the river, and every daughter, every woman, every female. 
you can let them live. You see, the devil knew what most of us have not realized as of yet. That if you destroy the man, then you destroy the race. In spite of you women being as bad as you are, with all the sense you have, all of your ability and capability, there's one thing you just can't do. I hear y'all talking, saying, I can do anything that a man can do. Almost. But you can't do everything. It take a man to reproduce. And if there is no reproduction, sooner or later, the race will be eliminated. Satan was sharp then and he is sharp even today. I want you to go over so you won't think that this is the gospel according to Frank Ray and back up to Genesis chapter 1, chapter 3 rather, and look at verse 1. It said, now the serpent, you know him, don't you? That's the devil was most subtle than in a beast of the field from which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman. Now you have to know that the man was at the house. But the devil went to the woman. Wonder why. Wonder why he didn't go to the man since the devil is so bad. Why he didn't go to the man and make these accusations about God to the man, but he went to the woman. Go over to First Peter, let's see. First Peter chapter 3. I told you, I'm glad you brought your Bibles. First Peter chapter 3 verse Seven. It said, likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. Meaning that she is weaker than the man is. And if Satan is going to launch an attack, you say, well, I don't know if Satan is going to bother me or not. I'm glad you made that statement. Go over to Ephesians chapter 6. I want to talk today if though everybody in here has grown. Ephesians chapter 6. Verse 10, notice his instructions. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole arm of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. It says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principality, against powers, against the rulers of darkness, against this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So the texts say that we are in a wrestling match. And he said, we need to have somebody that can handle the matches. 
You all are here, aren't you? And he knew that he could wage a war and get woman, and she would get the man. And so sometimes the devil will take the weaker vessel in order to dethrone the stronger vessel. So y'all won't think I'm making it up. Go back to Genesis 3 again and let me share with you what I'm saying. Verse 2 said, the woman said in the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God it says, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die, for God do it know in the day that you eat thereon, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Verse 6 said, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eye, a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took the fruit thereon, did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Watch verse 6 again. Look at the verbs. And when the woman saw, verb number 1, a look became a loss. That the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eye. A tree to be desired to make one wise. She took, verb number 2, a desire became a desire, became a decision. It said, of the fruit thereof, and she did eat, verb number 3, a choice became a chain. And watch it. It said, and gave. That's verb number four. A seducer became, a sinner became a seducer. She was a sinner. Now she decided to seduce her own husband. The first seduction took place in the Garden of Eden. If Satan had not got to Eve, he never would have got to Adam. Am I in this house by myself? And so there is a conspiracy to destroy man. If, if the devil can get man, women, you can rest assured that he's on his way after you. Huh? Let me share with you several ways. He is gradually easing in on, on masculinity, but he's using women to do it. A number of years ago, they came out with this women live business, women with equal rights and equal, equal opportunity, and that's well and good. But we need to know that God did not change his plans. I keep hearing folks that God is doing new things, but you'll have to erase the Bible to come up with that. You will have to eliminate the word totally because God is not doing anything in a newer now than what he did 2,000 years ago. Uh, so y'all won't think I'm making it up so I can show it to you in the word. Go to Malachi chapter 3 because y'all looking at me a little strange. Malachi chapter 3. That's the last Old Testament book in the Bible. Malachi chapter 3. And verse 6, it said, For I am the Lord. I what? Change not. You say, well, that's Old Testament. How about under grace? Well, let's go to Hebrew. Hebrew chapter 13. Hebrew chapter 13. I want to show it to you in the Word. Hebrew 13 and 8. It said, Jesus Christ. Y'all know him, don't you? Do you see the next word? The what? The same yesterday and today and what? Forever. He did not change. He is not changing and he shall never change. When God set orders up, they were in this way. First, God the Father. Second, God the Son. Third, God the Holy Ghost. Fourth, man. Fifth, woman. And then finally, the children. What has happened is the father is still in his place. The son is still in his place. The Holy Spirit is still in his place. But there is a division between where the man ought to be and where woman ought to be. 
And when they shuffle their positions, then the children are disturbed. Preach Reverend Ray. It should be the father, the mother, and children. Now we're trying to change the Bible and call God the breasted one. We're trying to eliminate masculinity in the word of God. They're teaching in theological seminaries now. You shouldn't say God, he. They want to say he's just as much she as he is he. That's erasing the word. Anybody going to help me in this house? I know I'm getting in trouble, but I'm going to stick with it. There is, a, there is a conspiracy to destroy man. And I'm afraid that we are not aware of it, but society is helping Satan out. What do you mean by that, preacher? Here's what I'm saying. Most cases, when I grew up, they would urge women and young ladies to go to college. But they would insist that young boys go get a job. Huh? And while he could get a job then, while young ladies had no money but going to school, now they got the big jobs. They have the executive and corporate offices where he have to go and sweep floors and clean toilets and bathrooms and work at McDonald's and Wendy's and anybody here? And whenever they come home, there is a division in the house because the biggest check come from her. And you can say what you want. A lot of folk are judged by their paycheck. Big money, big man. Little money, little man. No money, no man. And so now she walk around the house like a peacock, giving orders and instructions, and the man have to swallow it, hook, sink, pole, and all, and the children have the audacity to think that mama is in charge. Come on here now. And if you're not careful, you'll have little boys switching like little girls. And you'll have women talking with gross voices like men because there is a division between husband and wife, man and woman. There is a conspiracy against men. I, I, I used to know women that could make men. That if there's a man in your family, a husband or what have you, that's not up to par, women should be strong enough and lovable enough to say, buddy, I'm going to make you the man God wants you to be. I mean, you remember the time that they used to brag on their men? I mean, even if his hair was nappy, she said, I really love that nappy hair. He could, he, could, he could come home and hadn't bathed in a couple of days and she lay in his arms. I just really like that smell. But when they get through destroying him now with tongue and teeth, cutting him down, talking about you ain't nothing, you ain't no earthly good, you're good for nothing, it destroy his masculinity. He's already trying to catch up. He's behind in society. And sometimes you force him into going out doing stuff he ought not to do. And he find himself behind bars or living in the street. There is a conspiracy. Come on, y'all. Lay in the bed with him at night. And don't want him to touch you. My stomach is hurting I'm tired. I don't feel like being bothered. Don't touch me. But what you do is you open a door for somebody else to do some touching. Because he, a real man, want to be touched. 
I need some help in this house. A real man. He touch, touch him some kind of way. Rub, rub his head or his toes. S something. He, he, he a real. And when you don't touch him, and he go out and find Miss Jane, then he destroy his name, his reputation, and the devil's I got him where I want him, and and you jump on him because he went out there, but you didn't jump on him while he was there. The jumping ought to be before something happened, not, not after it happened. It ought to be. <laughs> I, I need some men to help me out here. In many, in, in many instances that I know that you ladies think that you know a lot, but you know everything but the man that you're with. Men are totally different from women. They think different. They act different. Uh, they, they, they make decisions different. A woman can say the same thing over and over. She can discuss it day and night, over and over. Man ain't going to discuss it but one time. Once he's through with it. You, you, you can bring it up today, you can bring it up tomorrow. He'll discuss it one time. But when he get through discussing it, you best leave it alone. Because whatever answer you get, thank God for it that you got to an answer. Because some of them won't answer you. But if you bring it up over and over again, he's going to give you the cold Am I in here by myself? Because it don't make sense to him to say the same thing over and over and over again. If I already told you he made a mistake, he messed up, he messed up, either shoot him or leave him alone. I don't believe y'all gonna help me in this house. But you can easily stop him from consoling to you and sharing with you his weaknesses. That if he's strong enough to share his weaknesses in any area, and when you take it and whip him over the head, I don't care how weak he get again, You'll never know it. He'll share it, but with somebody else. He ain't going to share it with you. Never. Preach Reverend Ray. Let, let me rush back to the text. Satan decided to destroy man. And he tried to do it at an early age. Watch this. When a young lady grow up, 18 and 20, she's restricted by her parents. Mother said, come home at a decent hour. Father, watch the boy she's with. But when the boy get 18, they turn him loose. Tell him you're free to sow wild oats. Go where you want to go. They don't tell you not to get a girl pregnant. They say, don't bring it here. <laughs> Nobody going to help me this house. When you ought to tell him, don't touch her until you're married. But we give him license to sow wild oats. And, and, and I've seen parents say to sons, don't be stuck with no one girl. 
go around. Spend some time with some other girls. Get to know them. In other words, you're giving him a license to be a playboy. And, and before you know it, every dime he spends will have to go for child support. <laughs> y- y'all going to help me in this house. He got five or six little children. He complained about he don't know if any of them his. Don't none of us know if they are ours. It's always mama's baby and daddy's maybe. <laughs> you, you'll help me here. I, I, my daddy, when I was very young, sitting at the house, told this story, and it was very comical, but it's true that said this man that he knew had, uh, had six, seven children, seven, eight. All of them were his color, dark-skinned. His wife was dark-skinned, but had one boy that was an albino. And he wasn't, he wasn't familiar with albinos, just the texture of the skin. That's about all it amount to. But, but he didn't know if that was his child. And he said to his wife, you sure that's my boy? She said, yes, darling, that's your son. Oh, I don't, he, he don't look like none of us. He ain't got nobody in my family look like him. And went on, and several months he brought it up again. Baby, I ain't got no problem with these other seven children, but this one, this, this Albina, are you sure he's mine? Yeah, baby, that's your child. Every other week, he'd bring it up at the table. You, is this, yes, yes, yes. He, he, he grieved so over that one child until he got sick. Had to put him in the hospital, and he grieved himself to death. He was on his deathbed, and while he was dying, his voice was weak. And he leaned over to his wife and said, Baby, I'm, I'm finna go. But before I die, I, I got to know the truth. I want to know if that boy, I ain't worried about the other seven, I want to know if that albino is mine. She went to cry. She cried and cried, and she finally said, that's the only one that is yours. (sighs) Let's walk through the text. (laughs) Now notice the arrival of Moses. Notice what time this child was born. Look at verse 22 of the first chapter again. And Pharaoh charged all his people saying, Every son that is born ye shall cast into the river. And every daughter ye shall save alive. He was born at the time that they were to destroy boy babies. Can you imagine if you was a mother that lived at that day and you was carrying a child and there's a sudden attachment that go along with carrying a child. Nobody know how much a mother love her child. That attachment get there while you're caring that baby. Your number one prayer is let my child be healthy and let me be the kind of a mother that I need to be to raise my child. Can you imagine the mother of Moses what kind of prayer she was praying while caring little Moses? Lord, please don't let it be a boy. Whatever you do, Lord, don't, don't, don't let me have a boy child because if it's a boy, I'll have to drown him. Mm. What a tragedy that hang over the head of a parent, knowing that when the child arrives, the child's life will be taken. 
But I see something else in the text. While she was concerned, God was working something out. Look at Exodus chapter 7 just for a moment. Chapter 7 and verse 7. It said Moses was fourscore years old and Aaron fourscore and three years old when they spoke unto Pharaoh. God had so destined that he knew he had to raise a person to bring Israel out of Egypt. And he knew that the person he wanted to send, he wanted them to at least be 80 years old. And for him to bring the chosen person at the right time, he had to allow him to be born in an hour of conflict. Y'all hear me? Did that go over y'all's head? In other words, you have to be careful how you treat any baby because God just might be preparing that child to bring us out of bondage. Let me show you something else. Go over to Jeremiah. I'm just in a kind of a teaching mood today. I'm, uh, Jeremiah, if you will, look at Jeremiah chapter chapter 1. That's, you go to Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Jeremiah. You find Jeremiah, say amen. Jeremiah uh, chapter 5. Chapter 1, verse 5, Jeremiah 1 and 5. It said, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. That means before I got here, I was known by God. It said, Before, uh, before thou came forth out of the womb, watch this, I what? sanctified thee and ordained thee a prophet unto the nation. Saints, be careful how you try to get rid of an unwanted child. Mistake number one is getting him when you're not married. Mistake number two is trying to destroy him after you got him. Y'all gonna help me here, ain't you? Because you need to know that when a child is born, there's a special blessing that comes from God to that child. He don't hold the child accountable for something the parents did. But God can take negatives and turn into positives. <sighs> Let's go back to our text. I'm, I'm, I'm moving on. It, it, so, so he was born in time but it was in what do time watch verse 2 it said and, well look at verse 1 again and there went a man of the house of Levi Exodus chapter 2 verse 1 and took the wife a daughter of Levi Levi was a tribe but the reason the Bible spell out the tribe they came from is because it is an unnoticed tribe. It's not one of the famous tribes or the 12 tribes of Israel. It's one of the forgotten tribes. Y'all hear me? What's the purpose of that? He's trying to say that Moses did not come from a family with a royal name. That sometimes you think you got to come from a royal family to be a blessing for God. But God can literally take a nobody that was born on the wrong side of the track and bring them up to be a blessing to the whole universe. Huh? I'm, I'm not through. It's, it's still, it says, and the woman conceived and what? Bear what? A son. And when she saw that he was a goodly child, saw that he had the hand of God on it. With God, she hid him three months. Now watch this. Not only do I see the arrival of Moses, I see the attitude about Moses. Now, the average person 
under that kind of pressure would have obeyed the law of the land. Because if she had got caught hiding the boy, she could have lost her life. Her, her husband would have been killed. And remember, she had two other children. She had Mariner, uh, who was Moses' sister. And she had Aaron, that was Moses' brother. Moses was the third child. She risked the lives of the whole family just for one child. Am I in this house alone? She risked the lives of all of them because... I see something in her life. I see the presence of faith in the life of Moses' mother and father. You see, faith will have you doing stuff you wouldn't normally do. Faith is never afraid to venture out. Faith will take steps and stands that a person without faith will never be able to do. That's why if you're going to live for the Lord, you must live by faith. The Bible said that the just shall live by faith. I, I detect that in this family that the mother and father both knew the Lord. And when you know the Lord, you know he's going to do something. You don't know what he's going to do, but you know he's going to make a way some way. And somehow you got to understand that the God, preach from Ray, that the God we serve is a God that if you have faith in him, you put God on a spot. She hid him for three Three months, not only do I see the presence of faith, I see the partnership of faith. Go to Hebrew chapter 11. Hebrew chapter 11, verse 23. Hebrew 11, 23. Hebrew 11. And look at 23. It said, by faith, Moses... When he was what? Born, was hid three months of his what? Parents. Now the Exodus episode make you think that it was only the mother doing it. But the Hebrew episode said daddy was in there too. Y'all ever notice that? You ever notice how one-sided the family is? Can I pause and say that? That on Mother's Day, my goodness, everything stopped. <laughs> Preach Reverend Ray. Me and I'm helping us today. Y'all need to say amen. On Mother's Day, everything stopped. Got to take mama out to dinner. Got to cook for mama. Got to buy mama a dress. Get mama a car. Stop. I ain't doing nothing. They, they mama's day. They mama's day. And if mama ain't here and mama dead and gone, you cry all day because mama ain't here. But on Father's Day. Poor man worked two or three jobs. Help me somebody. <laughs> Work from can to can, all he can and all he can't, he's still working. And on Father's Day, oh, I forgot, they father day, Eddie. Happy Father's Day, Dad, and go right on. One sided. <laughs> oh, boy, I ain't bad, am You say, well, preacher, what is faith anyway? Since you're in Hebrew 11, look at verse 1. It says, now, faith is what? The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Watch the word substance, S-U-B-S-T-A-N-C-E, -E, substance. It's two English words knitted together, sub, S-U-B, mean under. The machine that runs underneath the water is called a submarine. Something under. Stands is where you get the word stand. 
something you what? Stand upon. So what is faith? Faith is something under you that you uh -huh, stand up on. And the only reason we're here today is because we have faith in a God we can stand on. Because sometimes you walk through stuff you can't see. Am I in here by myself? But when you got faith, you can make it because it's not a tricky situation. You got somebody to stand on. I got a witness here. Got something. You've heard me say this time and time again that science and faith had a conversation with each other. Science of faith, you believe in stuff you can't see. Let me show you the real world. Face it all right. Science and faith went to walk in and they came to a flower garden. Science named all the flowers in the garden, told faith where each flower, where the bee get his honey from. Faith said, that's good. They kept on walking, came to a forest, all kind of trees. Science said to faith, that's a walnut tree. That's a pine. That's a willow, that's a saspis, that's a pecan, that's a maple, that's a dogwood. Named all the trees, kept walking, had a huge rock in the middle of the road, science stopped and said, Faith, I can tell you how old that rock is. They kept walking, got to a huge body of water, and science stopped in its tracks. Faith pushed him, said, Go on. Science, I can't go any further. There's a body of water, but no bridge. Face all right, science, get behind me. Faith came through the same area, so you told me about all of these flowers. That's good, but you missed two. You missed the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valley. Went on back through the forest, and so you named all of these trees, but you missed one. The tree of life came back by the huge rock in the road. So you told me about how old this rock is, but you forgot to mention the rock of ages. And then came to the huge body of water and faith just started stepping. Stepping. <laughs> Science hollering way back from the bank. Hey, how did you do that, man? He said, I got something under me that I can stand. Oh, my time is about out. I got to go on and wrap it up. Y'all know I could preach all day. Let's go back to the text one more time. We, we almost, we almost. I see the presence of faith, the partnership of faith, the priority of faith. What do you mean priority? Well, I need to show you another passage for y'all to understand. Go back to Acts chapter 5. We're going to wear this Bible out today. Acts chapter 5. Verse 29. Then Peter and the other apostle answered and said, We ought to obey God. Rather than what? Men, if you have to make a choice between God and man, pick God. Well, what if it's a life and death situation? If you have to make a choice between God and man, pick God. What if man going to kill me? If you have to. Make a decision between man and God. Pick God. You say, well, anybody ever did that? Let me call one more witness. You remember the Hebrew boys? Uh, Nebuchadnezzar said, look, you're going to either bow, bend, or burn. And they said, well, we might burn, but we ain't going to bow or bend. They put them in the fiery furnace. <laughs> Y'all remember that? They heated the fire up seven times hotter. 
and, and, and the king was sitting there and he looked in the furnace and they wasn't burned. They were loose, walking around, fellowshipping with each other. Hey, man, how you doing? Hey, hey, how you doing? I mean, they were fellowshipping in the fiery furnace. He said, what's going on down there? He said, wait a minute. One, two, three, four. He said, let me get one, two, three, Oh, secretary, how many did we put in there? He said, we didn't put but three in. He said, well, behold, I see four. He said, well, who is the fourth one? He said, I don't know, but he looked like the son of God. Have you ever been anywhere? <laughs> I could wrap it up now, y'all. Have you ever been anywhere when you thought you was by yourself? And when you looked up, it was somebody else in the crowd? Somebody in here know he, he will show up? Don't you ever think you're by yourself? When you think you're by yourself, the Lord will show up. And when he show up, he show out. I'm just talking about what I'm talking about. <laughs> mm. The priority of his faith. But I see something else. I see the peace of their faith. What you mean, preacher? Notice. He said to her, she said to them, take little Moses, put him in this basket and put him down in the Nile River. And down in this river were crocodiles. It's noted for crocodile territory. But a son is in there. Mm. Wild dogs and wolves and coyotes on shore. If you get too close, the dogs can swim out and get him. If you get too far, crocodiles would get him. But faith will give you peace. That when the storm is raging and everybody else is panicking. You can rest real easy because you got faith. Y'all looking at me strange? Let me tell you what I'm talking about. This The ship was rocking from one side to the other. Came on the intercom. Say, everybody, get in your seats, fasten your seat belt, put on your life guards, life preserve, because we're in a storm. While everybody else was running, a little girl was on the ship shooting marbles in the middle of the floor. Just shooting marbles. The captain said, little girl, not the captain, but one of the workers said, little girl, didn't you hear us say we're in a storm? She said, I heard you. Well, are you not afraid? She kept shooting marbles. No, I'm not afraid. Why is it you're not scared? She said, well, my father is the captain of this ship. And he know his little girl is on board. And my daddy ain't going to let nothing happen to me. I ought to tell somebody in this house today, you might be in a storm now and your friends and neighbors they all panic and say what you gonna do how, how you gonna get out of this but you're still cool 
still sleeping at night, still getting up in the morning. You're not on their pills, not on tranquilizers. And they don't know what's happening, but you're able to say, the reason I'm cool is because my father, our, yeah, is the captain of the ship. And he know I'm on board, and he ain't going to let nothing happen to his child. Do I have a witness? Put him in the bull rush. Position him, the Bible said, by the flags. What was the use of that? Well, what the flags would do is that when the boat, the little ark, would start floating and get into the stream, it will hit the flag and would stop it from getting caught up in the current. <laughs> God was protecting him right in the ark. And then one day, while he was there, <laughs> Pharaoh's daughter, she, she, she came to take a bath. And, and while Bathing in the Nile River. The, the, the Holy Spirit had her to notice the basket. And, and she went over, lifted the, the lid. And when she did that, God dispatched an angel to pinch little Moses. <laughs> and, and he started to cry. And uh, when uh, she saw him cry, it touched her heart. She said that, uh, now, now, now remember, the Nile was full of Hebrew babies. But they had all drowned because every woman that had a baby, they drowned him in the Nile. But here is one that wasn't dead. He was in the ark. Y'all hear me, don't you? He was in there safe and secure. I didn't tell you that the ark represent Jesus himself. You remember during the days of Noah, he pitched the ark inside and out. And everybody that got in the ark was safe. Y'all remember? It rained 40 days and 40 nights, but nobody in there was destroyed because that art was a representative of Jesus. Now I need to tell you that some of the folk in the art fell in there. I'm sure they slipped up and fell while they were in there, but they didn't fall out. <laughs> And I'm also sure by having all the stuff in the ark that was in there, it got kind of stinky in there. Because they had two elephants in there, and two giraffes, and two hippopotamuses, and two skunks, and two dogs, and two horses, and two cows. It got real stinky in there. But they didn't jump ship just because it had nasty odor. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying that in the church of God, that sometimes it gets stinky in here. So, so sometimes in here, you run into stinky situations. But don't jump off the ship just because it's stinky. The, the God I serve. He says, come to me, all ye. Not only can all come.